thanks for making some time to uh, talk today. I'm always excited to talk to um, <clears throat> young professionals like yourselves here about rail and transit. Um, it's been a passion in my career. We'll talk a little bit about rail transit in Minneapolis. We have an office there. I have staff there. And then we're going to end with something important to me, maybe important to you. I'm looking for interns, paid interns for this summer in quite a few locations around uh, the country. Also looking for new graduates. I got some new graduate openings in a variety of different areas. We'll talk about that. I've got some uh, listings of that information and material that I can share with any of you who want to talk later. So anyhow, here we go. I head up Rant Transit and Rail for WSP here in the United States. We used to be Parsons Brinkerhoff. You might be familiar with that name. Uh, we are now WSP, a company that can do all kinds of infrastructure, vertical buildings, horizontal transportation systems, tunnels, you name it, we can do it. So, <clears throat> we have been involved in uh, light rail in Minneapolis for about 15, well, I'll call it 19 years or so. Uh, so I'm going to give you a little bit of overview of some of the things we have done and are doing there right now. The ver how many of you have ridden light rail in Minneapolis? Quite a few. How many of you have ridden light rail anywhere? Excellent. Good, good, good. So, the initial segment uh, of light rail from the Met Council was, goes from the Mall of America to the airport on up to the uh, center of town. Um, initially kicked off in 2004. You can see some of the statistics there. Pretty robust system, right? 20,000 plus riders a day. Here's what the schedule for that work looked like. Um, the contractor was selected in the year 2000 and the service started in 2004. You can see that was a pretty quick construction schedule actually. You know, many of them take a little bit longer than that. That was pretty impressive. What actually was built? Well, there are segments of ballasted track, right? Look a little bit like this. Embedded track. Who knows what embedded track is? Inside uh, one with the pavement, right? Embedded within the pavement. So you can actually drive over it at a crossing or even where there are not crossings. Also direct fixation track. Here's an example of direct fixation, right? Rail right onto concrete, uh, tie pads or even slabs and the like. So we used all of those different methods there. Bridges are part of transit projects as well. Quite a few bridges. So this one was a pretty significant one over one of the main divided highways that provide access to MSP Airport. One of the interesting features of this project was the tunnel into the airport. You can see some of uh, the work going on in a cut and cover kind of way, right? You cut the earth, build your facility, provide a cover over it in a tunneling kind of way. But there's also some boring. Um, here's what the diameter of that tunnel ended up looking like. It's actually uh, two tunnels, isn't it? One for uh, northbound trains, one for southbound trains. Some facilities to connect the two, ventilation, control systems, and the like. So this was a pretty interesting light rail job because it included all those different types of track, elevated, subterranean, the whole, the whole thing. When you bore a hole in the ground, you have material to, to, to take somewhere, right? Got to figure out where you put that, especially in an urban environment. Here's a, a shot of what was used to sort of haul that material out and, and, uh, and put those spoils somewhere else. Electrification is part of light rail, right? Those trains do not run on diesel power. They run on electrified um, uh, right-of-way overhead catenary. That's one of those kinds of positions I'm looking for, people who are electrical folks interested in uh, overhead catenary and things like that, traction power, so just keep that in mind. Train control signaling, very important. That's one of the bigger parts of work that we do. We do a lot of train control signaling. Uh, we're helping Canadian National with positive train control, for example. Um, signal design for Metra in Chicago, where I live, uh, out on the West Coast and the East Coast. Train control signaling is a very important part of what we do. Stations are an interesting part of uh, a transit project. They all tend to be different. This is uh, the one located in the warehouse district. 
of uh, downtown Minneapolis, just a couple blocks away from where our office is in uh, Minneapolis. This one looks a little bit different, doesn't it? The next station to the east from the one we just looked at. This one even more different, a little further east to the east side of downtown. Very unique architectural issues. We as engineers tend to work pretty closely with the architectural folks and the urban planners to help think through, hey, where do pedestrians need to go? Where do they want to go? How do we get them funneled uh, from uh, the station itself to what was the Metrodome at that time? The new Vikings football stadium is in that location now. Do you think there ought to be art involved with transit? Who thinks yes? Who thinks no? Yes? Yes, art and transit? Why do you think? You're laughing. I like that. Are you? Okay. Okay, that's good. Well, that's exactly the goal of art and transit. Sometimes engineers tend to look, you know, a little sideways at it, like why are we spending two percent of the budget? Sometimes that's what it is, one or two percent of the budget on art. Um, sometimes engineers get criticized for um, um, using stick on art idea being let's design and build whatever we need to build and yeah let's put a pretty picture on it or do something with it it's called stick on art and that is not encouraged not encouraged I have never done anything like that in my life idea being just like you said it should be incorporated integrated you know and affect the environment that we live in and hopefully make us feel better and be healthier right exactly I like that you're exactly right so we did some cool things I do not know why there's a turtle here, but somebody thought that was artistic, I think. I'm not sure. I, I don't know that story. If you're running light rail vehicles, you got to maintain them somewhere, right? There's a whole facility dedicated to um, inspecting, maintaining, repairing these light rail vehicles. It was squeezed out of this site here. You can see the inside building where those uh, trains are maintained. Some of the storage tracks here, very, very tight site. This used to be a railroad passenger coach yard, so uh, it's a little tight for, for the fleet there in Minneapolis. I think it's about 50 cars, something like that. Here's what the shop looks like inside, right? It's bright, it's airy. Um, you need to be able to get above the trains, right, to inspect the pantographs and the other uh, HVAC equipment that's on top. You need to be able to get underneath it, right? Get underneath it, see what the traction motors look like braking systems, uh, anything else that's mounted underneath. When you build transit in an urban environment, do you have to think about utilities? Yes, you do. Water lines, sewer lines, gas lines, fiber optic lines, things you don't know are under there that you might find later are a big, big, big issue. Any of you ever think about being a utilities engineer? You do? What do you like about utilities, do you think? Um, well, I work for an internet service provider, so I'm very familiar with what is buried underground and the people who cut our fiber. It's very expensive. So you're the one I call when we find something we didn't think was here and say, man, you got to move it tomorrow. Sometimes we show up before you know you hit it, though. <laughs> uh, here's a man who knows what he's talking about. He knows what he's talking about. Seriously, projects like this, it's easy to think of as trains and track and stations, but you know what the real killers, the real scheduled drivers, real cost drivers are staying out of the way of utilities and getting your property and right-of-way purchased or acquired ahead of time. Property, right-of-way, utilities. That's how it goes for highway projects too, those of you who are thinking about that kind of a thing. So here we are um, getting the utilities moved out of the way so we can get them in the right place so we can build track and then the roadway back on top of that. So that was the initial starter line for the Twin Cities area, called the Hiawatha Line. It's now part of the original blue line. We are now uh, working on two extensions to the uh, light rail system in the Twin Cities. The first one is the Southwest LRT, uh, called the Green Line. Um, target field and the existing station is up here. We're going to extend the line along a uh, secondary railroad track owned by the county out here to the uh, southwest part of the community, Eden Prairie. Um, 
some of what my people do on that project or do structural design. There are quite a few long bridges spanning highways. We also do train control and signal design, both for uh, the light rail trains itself. When it crosses major highways, we do use railroad style uh, warning devices. But also, uh, there are some areas where um, the rail line itself, the freight rail line, is affected, and some of those crossing devices need to be relocated. The second project uh, called Botno, or the Blue Line Extension, goes from the downtown Minneapolis area up north um, toward Brooklyn Park and uh, this town of Crystal. Similar issues, we do some of the same kind of work you know, on that as well. There's another type of work we do too. We don't just uh, design and build new expansions of railroad. There are also enhancements and improvements and changes to the existing line too. This is uh, sort of a small project I wanted to talk about just a little bit. Um, this is a double crossover, as you can see, um, with uh, um, direct fixation track. This is kind of the finished product. This used to be embedded, and the reason you needed to make that change there was uh, there was only a single crossover, and Met Transit really wanted a double crossover for that operational flexibility, right? So that a train here could go on either track going that way, and the same vice versa. We only had is half of the crossover there before. It was embedded, it was in bad shape. There were corrosion issues, there were salt issues, all kinds of things. So they said, hey, we want you to make this double crossover and make it in um, direct fixation track. Um, <clears throat> what we, this is what we call state of good repair as well, meaning not just new, but maintaining what we have. How do we keep it functioning the way it was designed to, if not better? We actually did two different crossovers here. Things called the traction power load flow study was involved. That had to do with, hey, how much electrical current do we need uh, to be able to supply the number of trains and the way those trains operate? That's the kind of thing electrical engineers might do um, on a transit project like this. We talked about signaling before. You know, there's the ability to operate trains in both directions, both tracks using signal indications only, so we had people doing that design. Total construction cost of just that, those two crossovers was about $17 million, not a, not a small piece of change. Do you think there's a way we can get to this uh, YouTube link here? Uh, yeah, I probably should have checked on that before we... This is a time-lapse photography. It's going to show about two and a half minutes of the entire work that went on during the weekend. See, you can see them removing the old concrete and old track. You can see the sun going down, right? It's nighttime. Things got quiet for a while. I guess they went to sleep for a little bit. Now they're starting to lay out the formwork for the concrete that will be poured a little bit later on. The formwork takes quite a while. It looked like it took a whole day or so. Formwork. I see the walls kind of starting to get put in place there. See some concrete trucks in a little bit. Here's the rail going into place, sort of in a, in a framework kind of way. A lot of attention being paid right here where the switch machine goes and the actual um, moving part of the switch itself, the switch part of the turnout, I should say. done before the concrete gets poured. You saw the concrete trucks go through there pretty quick. Most cutovers like this because there is no train service you know, during that period of time. It usually is required to happen really, really quickly, as fast as possible. So often work happens at night as well. Some of these periods of no activity are a little bit unusual. So 
it's starting to look like it's in final form. Not quite, but getting there. Concrete's curing, I'm sure. Test train ran. Did you see that train go yeah. that direction? <laughs> cool. How many days was that, Phil? You know, I believe it was only one weekend. Probably from Saturday, well, you know, Friday evening until early, early Monday morning. Trains usually start running about 4 o'clock or so. So if we can get back to the slides. Should we get to go now? Awesome. Thank you for doing that. Here um, is the schedule that applies to that shutdown. Um, and it was one weekend from October 27th through the 30th. Look at all the different activities. And, you know, you can sort of see that. I, I know it. The time lapse made it move quickly, and you're kind of far away from the screen. But think about all those activities you choreograph. It. It's like a dance, right? It's like a dance in terms of exactly what do we do and when. And we forecast how long it's going to take. Because I got to tell you, if you're there at 4 a.m. on Monday morning, and the commuter train the commuters are starting to show up when they go to work, and you don't have the track back, there is no worse feeling. There's no worse feeling. And you know what? If you planned it out properly. You already know, say, late Saturday night, Sunday morning, Sunday noon, how are we doing? Do we need to do something different? Are we behind? If we're behind, what do we do? Because we're going to run trains Monday morning one way or the other, or some people are going to be looking for new jobs. So a lot of planning. Logistics goes into transit projects, too. It's not all design. <clears throat> so that's sort of my, my little overview of uh, light rail transit and how we developed that in the Twin Cities. Um, questions, comments on that before we talk just a little bit about you know my, my, my part of the world? Anything surprise you about what you saw? Um, just, uh, I don't know, I, like when I was in Minneapolis uh, a couple of months ago, uh, I, it, did, it, it, it seemed like it had a really big presence in the center of the city. Did or did not? It did. Did not. It did have. Yeah. That it did. Yeah. I think the um, that was kind of the event, so. Well, that's one of the aspects of the planning elements too. You know, where do you put stations? How do you how does the city make other investments in ways that support where the trains are? You know, it's not just where the people want to go, it's you can sort of encourage that a little bit. Can you develop around the station and put housing, for example, and all the things that housing needs, grocery stores, dry cleaners, all that kind of thing. Was WSB involved in any of the, um, the forecasting or planning, or was that all done by somebody else? You mean the ridership forecasting? Yes. Um, yes. We have a guy actually named Steve Ruig there who's very um, familiar with the actual ridership model that uh, the community there uses, that the Met Council uses, which is the MPO that does sort of the planning for this. Anybody else have any reaction to what you saw? Anything interesting? Anything that looked really out of place? Yes, sir. You have an idea. I see. I see it in your head. You have an idea. Uh, so, like, don't get me wrong, but uh, but in India, like, when there is a new track is laid, before the the actual run of the train, they have to do uh, like uh, like checking for like one month at least. Right. You know. But I have seen all this stuff this way. All oh, two first. You know, how about the safety? Like, you know, how do you measure those parameters? Because. Okay. You know, Good question. Um, if this were a new line, a complete new line, say, when we built, when we put those extensions in the service, mm -hmm. the testing and commissioning phase, that's what we call it, testing and commissioning, can easily be three to six months, mm -hmm. checking out everything because of all the different things you need to make sure are fitting together. Mm -hmm. Why did we not have to do that on this segment? Because it was already in service. We were replacing it generally in kind, mm -hmm. same trains same track structure yes the configuration is different but everything else is the same train control is still the same just um, sort of replaced in place that's the reason and we still you saw those test trains running probably probably for about four hours or so you know checking measurements checking the electrical electrical conductivity and the like that's a good question though you still got to do it it's just a lot less well, the uh, turnouts would have been delivered in place, or at least in place in the sense of placed um, 
built in, in, in one, but the rails, I think some of them, the, the fitter rails were separate. So if there are four turnouts, each one would have been a panel itself, and then you would have been connecting the pieces together. I wasn't there personally. It did look like they were doing a little bit more stick work than maybe they needed to. Not sure why that is. So, um, I do have a question about the <coughs> or maintenance or the, the, the crossover addition. What was the impact in, you know, of the loss of embedded right of way to the To the traffic lanes, yeah, to the yeah, highway yeah. vehicular traffic? Yes. Well, the interesting thing is, um, and actually this is a picture of the next crossover down the, down the line, not the one you saw the time lapse of, because you can see this is the scissors. Anyhow, uh, currently there's a traffic lane here and one traffic lane here, and they weren't driving on this part anyway. I don't know why the design 15 so years ago that. had embedded. I think the idea was for cars to be able to drive over it but it became clear that the negatives far outweighed the positives. And on the whole, we just didn't want people driving on that part of the track anyway. Sure. Yes. Uh, Jeff, yes. So how is this like light rail is different from like subway rails for like major urban cities? <clears throat> Good question. Some of it is nomenclature, light rail versus heavy rail. Heavy rail being uh, who's ridden uh, the L in Chicago? It's heavy rail. WMATA in New York, in uh, Washington, D.C., who's ridden the train there? Heavy rail. BART, BART out in San Francisco, who's ridden the train out there? Nobody. L.A.? Yeah, Fozzie has. Heavy rail. Why is it called that? Um, generally speaking, heavy rail does not include grade crossings. Generally speaking, the station spacing is just a little further apart. Generally speaking, there's level boarding. Idea being, you know, you walk right out of the train vehicle right onto the platform. While light rail tends to have stairs so that you can stop more frequently. Stations are a little less elaborate, a little, little less expensive. Light rail might share uh, right of way with cars. Street cars are sort of a uh, type of light rail almost, or at least it's the same technology. So some of it has to do with physical conditions like we just talked, some of it has to do with the way it's operated. Light rail being maybe a little slower, a little less frequent, and uh, stations closer together. Uh, so subway uh, for like uh, big cities, like uh, for all the major cities in the world have a like, subway system in them like, right now. So light rail is kind of like a, a trim down version for like new cities of that subway? Light rail is for when you want to stop more often. Is usually when you want to stop more often and you cannot necessarily grade separate your right of way. Those are usually the two reasons light rail is chosen as opposed to heavy rail. So, uh, for my knowledge, like, we have like three uh, parts for our light rails. Like, uh, they can travel on ground, they can be underground, and they can be elevated. Yes. So, how do we like catch on that budget? Like, uh, we want to build a ground rail system or like elevated rail system or like underground rail system? Well, a uh, couple factors. One of them, first of all, dedicated right of way or not, right, is one decision. Whether it's above or below, that gives you a little more capacity and a little more ability to move more trains and more people quicker because you don't have crossings in the way, right? So that's one decision. How much capacity do you need from your system? Whether you go above or beyond, that below goes back to your point of view. What does the community want? Do you mind trains up in the air like in the L in Chicago? Or do you really want to bury them where you don't have to look at them? What are the development patterns going on? Part of what you're hearing from me is it sort of depends. Depends on which of your objectives is most important. Because you're pointing out there are a couple different ways to skin the cat, right? A couple different places to build the system. So I know my time's about up, but what I did want to share is um, we are looking for interns in a wide variety of locations around the country. I know it's a little bit late, but those of you who maybe do not have internships set up for this summer, I'd love to talk to you after, uh, after your meeting here. I'll stick around. I do have some handouts in terms of locations and types of work. Might be vehicle related, might be track related, might be signal or traction power related. Love to talk to those of you who think you might be interested. 
also uh, new graduates, looking to hire new graduates as well, starting either this uh, spring yet or later this fall, those of you graduating maybe in the winter time. Again, a wide range of different kinds of work we do, um, opportunities throughout the country. We've got a website uh, that can give you some sense of how to apply for that, or uh, there's an email address on that piece of paper. Carrie Desmond um, sort of runs the intern and new grad program for me. I'll give you my card as well. Very interested in talking to any of you who are interested in a good internship or an interesting new graduate experience. We love to hire new people, uh, bring new, fresh thinking on board. And you know what? Posse and Dave and, and Bill and the gang here have, have turned out some graduates that worked out okay for us. So I'm guessing maybe you can too. What do you think? Okay. Other questions, comments before we close up? Well, thank you so much for uh, listening. Sorry we're a few minutes late. Stick around.